So in this lesson, we'll look at an important question in switch design, which is how much buffering do routers and switches need? It's fairly well known that routers and switches do need packet buffers to accommodate for statistical multiplexing. But it's less clear how much packet buffering is really necessary. Now, given that queuing delay is really the only variable part of packet delay in the internet, you'd think that we'd know the answer to this question already. And for quite some time, there had been some well-understood rules of thumb but it turns out that we've recently revisited this question and come up with some different answers. So let's first look at the universally applied rule of thumb. Now for the sake of the examples in this lesson, I'm going to use routers and switches interchangeably because it doesn't really matter. All that matters here is that we have a network device that's a store and forward packet device that has the capability of storing a frame or a packet and then later sending it on. So let's suppose that we have a path between a source and a destination, and the round trip propagation delay is 2t, and the capacity of the bottleneck link is c. Now the commonly held view is that this router needs a buffer of 2t times c. It should be clear why this rule of thumb exists. c is the capacity of the bottleneck link in, say, bits per second, and t is a time of unit second. So this works out to bits and the meaning of this quantity is simply the number of bits that could be outstanding along this path at any given time. It effectively represents the maximum amount of outstanding data that could be on this path between the source and destination at any time. Now this rule of thumb guideline was mandated in many backbone and edge routers for many years. It appears in RFCs and IETF architectural guidelines and it has major consequences for router design simply because this can be a lot of router memory and memory can be expensive. The other thing, of course, is that the bigger these buffers, not only the bigger the cost, but also the bigger the queuing delay that could exist at any given router. And hence, the more delay that interactive traffic may experience and the more delay that feedback about congestion will experience. The longer these delays are, the longer it will take for the source to hear about congestion that might exist in the network. Now to understand why this guideline is incorrect, let's first rederive the rule of thumb a bit more formally, and then we'll understand why it does not always apply in practice. 